So, Father, we come before you confessing our sin, our unbelief, our worry, our fear, our, our grief, our anger, our bitterness, in an inordinate. Those things that life has, all, has dealt us, where we've not trusted you, where we've trusted ourselves, where we have reacted, Father. We, we justify our reactions by telling ourselves that, that, that who wouldn't react like this? And yet, there's a better way. And that better way is Jesus Christ. So, Father, we come today and we come to praise you. We come to worship you. We come to learn about your son. We pray that you'll give us great insight and, and comfort today. In Christ's name, amen. I'm studying the book of Colossians and I'm, I'm going down chapter one and Paul's talking about just the normal things that deal with personal daily life growth issues. He, uh, he's thankful. Uh, he explains about salvation and the faith in Christ and hope. It's interesting in chapter 1, he uses this formula, faith, hope, and love, which some see as just three separate virtues, which I see more as a system. But he gets down to chapter 9, I mean verse 9, and he talks about his prayer for them is that they will grow spiritually in, in knowledge of God's will with all spiritual wisdom and understanding. That you, Verse 10, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Then he says, after, after you got that rolling in your life, you got your learning you're assimilating, you're building a belief system, uh, you're, you're gaining strength to lay aside your old belief system and live in the new man. He says this, this brings strength, strengthened with all power according to his glorious power, his might, so that you may attain endurance, patience, and joy, giving thanks to the Father who has made us qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Then he says, for he delivered us from the domain of darkness. This is a passage we've read many times. And transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. In whom, the beloved son, we have redemption. We've been bought out of the slave market. We've been set free. The forgiveness of sins. Now, so far, Paul has kept just standard, basic things that he talks about in every book. But then in verse 15 uh, through 19, he's going to go off. He's going to go on a rant. And this may or may not have been a, a hymn that he's quoting. I don't know, but it, it's, it's common for him to do that. But he goes off on a rant on Christ, and he, he is going to give us the Christmas story. It says, He, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is the manifestation. He's the icon. An icon is an image that represents something else. He is the image of the invisible God. When you look at him, he, he told Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know, show us the Father. Well, look, look at me, and you see the Father. I and the Father are the same. We're one. He's the in, and I won't go into the fact that these terms, the image, the icon, and the firstborn were terms used by the Gnostics in the first century uh, to, to describe a whole different system of religion that was in competition with Judaism uh, and Christianity. Paul is really refuting a Gnostic thing, but he says, for by him all things were created, both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Listen to all the things he includes. All things on earth uh, uh, were created by him, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Thrones, which are rulerships, earthly rulers, 
dominions, which some say are angels, uh, others say are systems of authority. Rulers or authorities are fallen angels. He created the fallen angels. Uh, listen, he created the fallen angels who were pretending to be <laughs> help be responsible for the creation. He said, I created you too, guys. And, he, and uh, all things have been created by him and for him. So, really, that's through him and for him. But And then he is... He predates all things. He is before all things. And in him, all things are held together. This is Hebrews 1. This is John 1. And then he said, he is also the head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning. And we're going to look at that, the beginning of what? What do you mean the beginning? He's the beginning. He is the beginning. The firstborn from the dead. So that he himself might come to have first place in all things. So, and he says, and it was, in, it was the Father's, hey, this is Ron's Bible up here. It's got a little, <laughs> don't you love a Bible like that? It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things. So, I'm studying along, and I'm really just blown away by this passage about Jesus Christ. And I realize, you know, most of the studying and teaching that I've done in my years, which has been quite a few now, has been focused on living. Uh, I, I'm not an esoteric kind of guy. I mean, I think deep and I think broad, but I'm focused on living. How do we do this? Mostly on how. You know, people teach, tell you what to do. Here's what you should think. Here's how you should feel. Here's how you should speak and act. My question has always been, well, how do I do that? How do I get myself? Because I, I don't, that's not what I want to do. I don't want, I mean, my, I want to live like that, but my gut level instinctive behaviors in the moment seem to go the other way. Romans chapter 7. So how do I get myself over here in the spirit, in the new man, thinking and live this way consistently? How do I do that? What is the procedure? What are the choices that I must make? What is it that I'm to tell myself and, and see in my mind that it will motivate me, emote me to choose for the Lord? That's where I've spent my life thinking. But when I got to this passage, I thought, you know, he, he's not talking about that. He's talking. He's taking Jesus Christ, and he's he made a big billboard. He said it's it's time to look at him for who and what he is. It's time for you to understand. I, I did a lesson before about this passage, and I talked about the Godfather, how in the beginning of the movie, the Godfather sends his attorney to convince this producer to let his godson have a part in the movie. And he's like, there's no way. And after much persuasion, the guy says, well, you know, I didn't really know who you were with. I didn't know you were with Corleone. And I, I, when I read this passage, I realized I had never realized, I had never known who I was with, who I was in, who I was part of now. This passage is just incredible. In the description, it takes us all the way back into eternity past where God the Son the Lord Jesus Christ lived and existed and created. He created a whole race of, uh, of creatures, angels, and administered a whole race and civilization of creatures in their fall, in their judgment, in the angelic conflict, in all the things that have gone. He's, he's been doing high-level things way, way, way before we even came along. We think of him as this little baby in the manger at Christmas time. Okay, yes, he is. But he's way more than that. And he's been, he's been going at this much, much longer than that. So let's try to, uh, for me, it was, it was a wake-up call to see who, who is it I'm with. Who is this guy? And I called it his resume. 
This is the eternal resume. But in it, I want you to see today three beginnings. So the person created the universe with a word, also created angels, ruled their civilization, judged the angelic fall, and is, and is now overseeing the angelic conflict. This eternal person decided to become one of us. You know, we were talking on the way in. You know, if, a, if somebody creates something that goes bad on you, you know, you create something and you think this is going to be great, and then it just turns south, goes south. What do you do? Have you ever seen the potter with the clay? You know, he's, he's got it on the wheel, and it, then it goes bad, and it comes apart. Well, he just lumps it back and beats it together and starts over. The Lord didn't do that with us. We went south. Angels went south. He didn't do that with us. He decided to redeem us. He kept us. He became, <laughs> listen, he became one of us. Do you understand that? Adam sinned. We became unrighteous. We became unworthy. We acquired a sin nature. Our very choices. Genesis 6 says every thought of every man all the time, every motive of every person was evil all the time. Continually evil all the time. And yet, he redeemed us. He became one of us. I think that's pretty amazing to me. But, so, this eternal person decided to become one of us to resolve our judicial issues, to show us how to live, to enable us to overcome our sin and belief system problems, and to walk with us through every challenge in this life. Then he will take all believers, give us a resurrection, and then superman bodies and lead us into the new adventures that we haven't even heard about yet. Merry Christmas. Do you realize when he came back from the dead, and we'll talk about it, he came back in a superman body, walked through walls, apparently it could fly, it could eat. He was hungry and he ate, but he didn't eat. You can, you're going to get to eat all you want and not get fat. <laughs> now, if, there's not a, if that's not heaven, I don't know what heaven is. So, I've been reading a lot about this. Some people speculate that they're still going to be male and female because it took male and female in the beginning to uh, create the image of God, image and likeness. So, I'll let your mind race with that. God the Son, God the man, uh, the God man, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ is described in three distinct phases of his life that I'm calling beginnings. The first beginning, which was actually not a beginning because he's eternal, but it describes his work when he created the universe and as the administrator of the angelic and human civilizations. Verse 16 and 17 of our passage. Colossians 1, he's the creator and the root the, that holds all things together. He's the root of all the universal laws of the universe. All the things that science works so hard to discover to prove there is no God, he is, those are his rules. He set them up. They, and it's, if he were to poof, they would poof. That's the first beginning. The second beginning was his conception and birth to become the God-man and to perform all the prophetic work of salvation through his life, death, burial, and resurrection. You know, it's interesting. I wonder, we were talked also in the, on the way, or I guess I talked. Uh, you know, it, it appears that humans were able and maybe intended to die all along. You, you you ask the question, would Adam and Eve have died had they not sinned? Well, Christ died, and he didn't sin. Cross didn't kill him. The sin that was put on him didn't kill him. He died. He, he voluntarily died. So death, in other words, a, a, a living in this phase, and then the moving through to the next phase was always the plan. Always the plan. Am I right? What do you think? No, he didn't. 
He died spiritually because of sin. He didn't die physically because of sin. He willed himself to death. Am I right about that? I mean, if I'm not, then okay. But, I mean, he, when he said it's finished, the spiritual part was done. The sins were paid. Then he breathed out and didn't breathe back again. So, just, a, just an interesting, as for now that, since we're talking about it, he says in verse 15, 19, and 20, he's the image and firstborn. All the fullness dwelled in him, reconciled all things to himself. So thirdly, the third phase of his life began with, began with his resurrection when he returned with a human body that appeared to have superhuman-like abilities. And he came back. He's promised that we will not only be with him, but we'll have bodies like his to become the first of a race of supermen, superwomen, that go with him into the eternal state. That literally come, the church age believers will come back with him uh, when he returns at the millennium. We'll come back with him as part of, the, of his army with these resurrection bodies, these superman bodies that are able to do things that we don't even dream about yet. Who knows what we'll be able to do? But look, this is our future. Here's what Christmas to me is about. It's not just a baby in a manger. It's not even just, look, I've been saved since 43 years. I mean, I've been, I've been knowing I was saved for 43 years. I've, I, I'm so grateful for that every day, but I'm moving on in my thoughts to, because as you get a little older, you wonder, where, would, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Well, I'll tell you where we go from here. We're coming back as supermen, a whole race of supermen, a whole army of supermen to do incredible things that God hasn't even told us about yet. Now, am I wrong? I don't think so. That kind of excites me because I like adventures. He's the head of the body, the beginning, the first place in all things. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, beheld by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. There's another summary. Hebrews 1.1-4. 1, 1 God the Son... The heir, he's the heir of all things. <clears throat> turn to Hebrews for a minute. Just turn to Hebrews 1. That's just, Hebrews 1 is just an incredible summary. I wanted to read that. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4. <clears throat> God, God, Verse 1, after he had spoken long ago to the fathers, that is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in many portions, in many ways, in these last days, since Christ has come, has spoken to us in his son. And he goes, he is going to describe the son, God, the, the God-man, whom he <clears throat> appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the universe. Here's the image and firstborn idea. He is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature, and he holds all things together by his powerful word. See, there, we're back to clock. Well, same thing Paul's saying. <clears throat> when he had made purification for sin... He sat down at the right hand. He was taken up in glory, sat at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become much more, much better than angels, just as he has inherited a more excellent name than angels. So he has elevated the human race <clears throat> in our resurrection above the angels. More powerful, whatever. We're above them. Merry Christmas. You've been given a better name, a better position. You're going to be given better power. Listen, folks, 
we're going through crazy times in our nation, maybe really difficult, terrible times perhaps from a human perspective, but look, we're only going to be here a little longer. <laughs> Some of us a little longer than others, but we're moving through here. We're getting out of here. We're, we're, we're sojourners. This is not a, this is, listen, we just camp out. This is like camping out in the woods compared to where we're headed. Okay? This is not our permanent home. We don't get to camp out here and stay here. <laughs> we, get to, we, get to, we get to stay here for a while, and then we get to go on. And, and amen, and thank you, Lord. We go on to a whole new eternal adventures. We're going to be with God. Whatever eternity is, however it's figured from the mind of God, I don't know how to understand time from his perspective. Uh, Rhonda was asking this morning, what does it mean that he's lived forever? What does that mean? How do you do that? And you go, well, the human mind, even with the Holy Spirit, can't see past a certain point. I mean, I can think a billion years ago, and then another billion years ago, and then another billion years ago, and at some point your mind just gives up. And, and so I wonder if time isn't different for God. It doesn't really work that way that it does for us. But these are the three beginnings that I wanted to share with you, and let's talk about them. First of all, beginning one, God, in, God the Son in eternity. This is a beginning that wasn't a beginning. When it says in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, it means in the beginning when they created. There was, there was a whole eternal phase before the beginning. And John tells us that God the Son, i.e. the Logos, the Word, was with God all that time. He kept on being imperfect tense of I am me. He kept on being with God in eternity. So all of that eternal time before the beginning when the Father, Son, and Spirit were all together having a wonderful time with each other, God the Son was there. He was part of it. Co-equal, co-eternal. Now, as we look back, there's several things that we can discuss. First, the Eternal Life Conference, what we call the plan they put together for creation. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit plan together to create the universe and its creatures. We call it the divine decrees. It's really the divine decree, but we call it a plan. We, we, we visualize for our sake them getting together and formulating a plan, when in reality, they never really did that. Because God is eternal and God is omniscient, which means God has always existed and God has always known everything. He always knew what he's going to do. And so it wasn't like they had to sit down and plan it out. They already knew. And I don't know how that works. See, God is not like us. He's not like us. He's way more than us. So when we try to ascribe to him human feelings and emotions, see, the Bible does that. It's called an anthropopathism or an anthropomorphism where, where God is described so that we can relate. But it's not really real. It's kind of just a visual aid to give us a, an inkling of how he is and who he is and what he's like. He's just immense, beyond we just get a peek into his bigness, if you will. That's a Trump word, <laughs> his bigness. All right, the Eternal Life Conference. Listen, Acts 2.23. This man, Jesus Christ, delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. So going to the cross was not a surprise. It was not the work of man. It was not the plan of man. It was the plan of God. That's why he knew from the beginning when he began to tell them that, look, you think I'm going to become a political leader, a military leader, and free the nation Israel from Rome. Look, let me put it in today's terms. You think that I'm going to raise up a military and political leader to 
free America from the political forces trying to bring it down. That wasn't his, that wasn't his mission. Now, whether it's his mission for us or not, I don't know. We shall see what he decides and what he's already decided. But it wasn't his mission for Israel. They thought it was. They wanted it to be that so bad, they couldn't see anything else. They couldn't see that the spiritual issues that he had come to deal with and resolve were so much greater than their national freedom. Just like Elijah couldn't understand that God was trying to create a, 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 a great a revival of spiritual life, not just bring about justice in human life. Okay? We got to keep that in mind. As we go through these difficult days, we have to keep that in mind that there are bigger issues than even our own human national freedom. I'm not saying those aren't big issues, and I'm not saying what people should do. I'm just saying that our role, my role, is bigger than that. It's spiritual. It's bringing about salvation of souls. That's why Christ came. He was delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You, you, the, this guy you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. In Isaiah 46.10, Here's the guy, here's the eternal conference. He says, you declare the end from the beginning. You declare the end from the beginning. He already knows, guys. He's already way ahead. He's already got it laid out. He's already got it taken care of. We just got to walk in it. We got to trust and walk in it. We got to surrender and stop fighting. Stop, stop arguing with God about what ought to be happening. Now, does that mean we don't pray for what is right? For that which he has declared in his word is his, is his will? Absolutely, we pray for that. We ask for justice. We ask for righteousness to rule. We ask for the truth to come out. We stay at the door. We stay in the, in the throne room asking that consistently, constantly. But it doesn't mean it comes out in our time. Those things will come. God will be vindicated. God's not going to let everything just go. He doesn't sweep anything under the rug. But people that you might not be liking very much right now, that you think are evil and are, are listen, Christ paid for their sins as well. He paid for their sins as well. So he says, pray for your enemies. Give the gospel to your enemies. I know. When I'm not up here responsible to the Lord for what I say, my thoughts go a different direction. They go a different direction, not necessarily a really nice direction either. John 1, 3. All things came into being by him. Now, uh, let's look at the creator. I'm sorry. We're, we're back in the beginning with Christ, God the Son, and they're in this eternal life conference they're deciding what's going to happen. You know, uh, I like the idea that Ron has proposed that maybe that Lucifer got wind of the fact that God the Son was going to be a human being rather than an angel. He's going he's to connect humanity to deity forever instead of angels. Or maybe Lucifer wanted that role. He wanted to play a part in it, and God said, no. Whatever it was, he felt limited. Same thing he said to Eve. God's holding back on you. He doesn't want you to experience, have the full experience. He's limiting you. That's what, I think that's how he felt. There's something he wanted that God said, no. This is, I've created you for this purpose. This is your role. The, here's your boundaries. He wasn't content with that, and he, and he broke through the boundaries. That's what Eve did. So in the Eternal Life Conference, it became clear that God the Son was going to become a human being forever, that we were going to be with him and part of this whole eternal army of supermen forever. 
not angels, that we were going to be higher than angels, that God was going to create a, make a creation, create a creature that was going to end up higher than they were. You know, that could have really made him mad when he realized even though he was the highest creature, the plan came out that there was going to be creatures that were higher than them, that even him. Hmm. Something. All things came into being by him. Apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Dia plus the genitive is intermediate agency. In other words, he didn't, he didn't put his hands on it directly. That's the spirit's job. But he was like the supervisor of creation, the architect. Romans eleven thirty six, for out from him and through him and for him or unto him all things are, are all things. Here's, this is Paul again. To him be the glory forever, amen. Now I'm in the creator. Yeah, he's the creator. So thirdly, in the first phase is the appointment to suffer. Again, Acts 2.23, he was, he was nailed to the cross by the, the uh, appointment and foreknowledge of God. In, Ch in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, we're given a view back into the mind of God the Son when the eternal plan was being discussed. It says, although he existed... He was living his life in the form of God as deity. God the Father, Son, and Spirit are all together discussing what's going to happen. When it was told to him that he was going to go become a man and go through this humble experience, even to the point of dying on a cross, being crucified, he didn't object. It says, he did not require, regard his equality with God, in other words, the remaining in his position of deity with all the rights and all the glory. He did not hang on to that. He did not think of that as something to be held. It means to be grasped. It means to be snatched. You say, no, I'm, a, I'm taking that back. That's the idea. He did not think that way. He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped and held, but emptied himself. Kenosis means he limited the use of his deity in the incarnation as a human being. He emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. So just deity, it's taken me many years to try to understand how the hypostatic union works, but here's my best shot at this point. God the Son is a person. He's an eternally existing, unique person of his own. And he limited the use of his deity. How he did that, I don't know, because he, he was holding the universe together at the same time he was a baby in the cradle. Now, how you do that, that's beyond me. But he added to his own person uh, a human nature and a human body. He put himself inside of humanity. He's outside of humanity and inside of humanity, just like the spirit is in us. But the two, he, he, he's not another, it's not two people. He wasn't born out of Mary as a different person. It's the same person. It's the same person who became a human being and went through conception and birth and first grade and second grade and middle school. Who wants to go through middle school again? Who wants to have Miss Rhonda as a teacher at sixth grade again? Everybody. All of our students. Now, appointed to suffer, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, he was found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. Now, here's God the Son, the eternal existing creator of the universe, who comes into the creation itself to, re to redeem it, to resolve the sin issue. He, he puts himself into the lowest position possible. 
He's born in Galilee. Can anything come, uh, it's Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Isn't that what they said? Or was it Galilee? In other words, he put himself in the lowest position in Israel, a laborer. He wasn't royalty. He was royalty. <laughs> he was royalty of royalties, king of kings. Yet he put himself in the lowest position, and he lived this humble life. And the great impact that he had in his personal life was, was his soul interacting with other souls. I, I really, one of the things I think about is how is it that he had such, he could walk up on people and just have such, he just grabbed them, just engaged them, and they just opened to him. And what was it about him? Was it? Did they see love in him? Did they see power? Did they, what did they sense from this humble guy? That means he had nothing, nothing to buy them with or, or nothing. He had nothing, and yet he walked upon them, and they, gave, and they just spilled the beans. They gave him everything. <laughs> he walked up to a guy. Of course, they, it wasn't that they didn't know about him. They, he was the buzz, when he, when he, especially after John the Baptist. But he come up to a guy, fishermen. Look, fishermen, these were not, these guys didn't sip their tea with their finger up, you know. They, these were grunts. And he come up and say, you, you follow me. Come with me. You're coming with me now. And they go, well, I guess I'm coming with you now. What, did, what was it about him? And here's the next question for me is, is, is that, is that to be, can that be me? Can that be me? And those of you who know me go, no, probably not. <laughs> probably not. Maybe somebody else, but not you. Can that be you? Can that be us? Can we have that kind of love and certainty and confidence in the Lord and in, in freedom from the old way to live so completely in the new way that when you walk up on people and they look at you and there's nothing but love and care and concern, no need, no neediness, no wanting something, only gift. Can people see that in you? Can, can that be, is that possible? I wonder. I pray for that. Secondly, as I preach, the second beginning, of course, is what we consider Christmas, conception and birth into the human race. First, he was the seed of the woman, discussed in Genesis 3.15. The plan all along was for God the Son to join himself to humanity by taking a human body and a human soul. I mean, I don't know how that works. Again, it was the same person. He didn't have a different soul. He had a human nature and a human body. Uh, uh, and live a righteous, he had a righteous human, human nature to his deity. He added humanity in a righteous form to his deity. And look, I'm just throwing out stuff, to, trying to understand that. I'm trying to understand that. God kept the prophetic line of Messiah hidden. I think, Ron, you just talked about that, how he kept it hidden and slowly unfolded the heirs the seed throughout the age of the Gentiles and the age of the Jews down to Joseph and Mary. You know, he kept it hidden because of the, possibly the angelic attacks on, on, on the line of David, on the, on the seed, the line of the woman. Hebrews 10, 5 says, Therefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired but a body you have prepared for me. In other words, he's going to be the sacrifice and offering. He's saying that the sacrifices and offerings have run their course of the Old Testament. So, secondly is the virgin conception. He was carried to term in Mary's womb with a natural birth. It was the conception that was the miracle. Luke 1, 26 through 35, Gabriel and Mary discuss this conception. And Mary wants to know, and Gabriel says, the Lord's going to 
overshadow you. He's going to provide the chromosomes. Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Hebrews 10, 5 again, Therefore when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. Gabriel provided, or God provided, sorry, Gabriel didn't do it. God provided 23 male chromosomes to combine with the 23 in Mary's egg, creating a human being, the Son of God. And thirdly, the natural progression into adulthood and up to the death on the cross. In Luke 2.52, it says, And Jesus kept on increasing in wisdom and stature and kept on having favor with God and men. He grew in a normal way, in fact, a super normal way. He continued to grow and develop as a human being. And by the time he was 12 years old, he had great wisdom and understanding about the scriptures and what they meant and what, what his role in them was. And he wanted to be about, he wanted to enter into his ministry at 12 years old. Because you know, at 13, a, a Jewish boy became uh, technically, legally an adult. Doesn't mean he's a mature adult, but he was an adult. Uh, unlike our time when we go up to 21, because see, they didn't have teenage years. You became, you, you went to work at age 13. You became an apprentice. You went into the workforce. You had responsibilities. Uh, he wanted to enter into those at, at uh, 13 years old. And, it, and his mother said, it's not time. And he honored that. But he had a perfect body, no sin nature. He, he experienced perfect human development and perfect spiritual development. Everything was perfect. Where you and I have a sin nature that causes us to misunderstand everything in our life and create ideas about our life that aren't true. Uh, this, this is what we call baggage. We inherit baggage genetically from our, our, our parents and grandparents, and then we parlay this inherited predisposition into our own sin patterns creating our own pain and sorrow and baggage that we, of course, passed down. He, he, he bypassed all that. Missed it all completely. He, all, he ever, all he ever put together in his soul was the divine plan, the divine word, the divine principles. Everything was perfect in him. He didn't have regrets. No regrets. No mistakes. Perfect. He did it perfect. How about that? I mean, that qualified him to be the sacrifice. If he had not done that, he wouldn't have been qualified. He'd, he'd have been a sinner. But he wasn't. He was perfect. In John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And this was the end of his earthly tour. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit the end of his life as a perfect humanity. He was born as a perfect person. He lived as a perfect person. He made choices as a perfect person. And, and that qualified him to be the sacrifice to take our sins away from us and put them on him to resolve them. However that actually worked in the, between the father and the son on the cross, we say he paid for the sins. Okay? I, I don't know exactly what that means, but Again, it means that, I'll tell you what it does mean for me, it means that they're not held against me. I got a text last night from a very dear friend of mine, old friend I've known since I was five. It's a young uh, a woman, and, and we had gone through some things together in, as teenagers and young people, and she was reading the scripture. She read Romans 11. took her many, many years to become a Christian and then to become serious about being a Christian. Oh, I don't remember. The whole thing was about sinfulness, to lay aside your sinfulness. Uh, and it was, of course, about lascivious sinfulness, which everybody thinks of as sin. 
And she said, why do I feel so guilty? I mean, she said, I haven't done any of that in 40 years, and why do I feel so guilty? You know? I said, well, you know all that's paid for. She said, I know that, but I still feel guilty in my soul. I still regret. So, see, there's a whole discussion about when you look back on your life and you realize that you didn't follow God's plan like Christ did, and you made all these mistakes, and you hurt other people, and you hurt yourself, and now here you are, and you've not ever really taken those things to the Lord to give them to him, to see him forgive you. What do you do with that? I mean, are you supposed to live with guilt the rest of your life? Not ever get over it? I don't believe that. I believe God has provided a means for us to be free of those things. And the emotions, and see, to feel guilt at this point is wrong thinking. It's, it's not right. It's wrong thinking. She's not thinking about it properly. Christ paid for it. You're free of it. Yes, you did it. Every human being that's ever lived has done it. Some in this lascivious way, some in a religious, self-righteous way. Just different forms of sinfulness. Jesus Christ didn't have that, and yet he took all of ours on himself, and he just, he just disappeared it, he resolved it in the courtroom of heaven so that when you stand before God, he's not going to ask you about your sins. Your sins will never be mentioned again, ever, ever, ever. He remembers them no more. Whew. Wow, Merry Christmas. I mean, the ones you haven't done yet. I mean, you're not done. You think you're done because you're old? <laughs> and you guys are old, I'm telling you. Thirdly, the last beginning three was the post-resurrection. This is the one that excites me. I mean, I've studied the other so many times, and I'm so confident in all these other things, and I've known them for years, and I love hearing about it all over again. But this future, looking to the future, listen, the Christian life is living in the now. Look, it's looking in the past to resolve issues so that they don't come into the present. That's the only reason you look into the past is to, is to find things that are wrong in your thinking, bad patterns of thinking that you've developed that are, that are interfering with your present life. Those things need to be addressed, confronted, and resolved. So they no longer come into your present. Let it go. Paul's talk. I mean, he says, I, le I left all that stuff behind. Doesn't mean it's, the passage, unfortunately, says forgetting what's behind. It doesn't say that. It says leaving it behind. The guy just talked about his whole life. He didn't forget what was the past. He, he resolved what was the past. Now, then you live in the moment looking to the future. Christianity is a next life religion. It's a religion. It's the next life system of thinking. It's the next life. It's all of this is for the next. Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself might come to have first place in all things. He's the head of the body, the kephale. I mean, he's the supreme authority over the church. He is seated in heaven while his spiritual body is in the flesh on planet earth representing him. It's also his body are those believers in the church age that have gone to heaven. We're still all one body. We're, we're stones in the temple of God. Holy Spirit still indwells. See, the Holy Spirit still indwells in those people in heaven. Holy Spirit's going to indwell us forever. These new bodies that we're going to get, Superman bodies, the Holy Spirit's going to be in and empowering all that. It's all, always going to be God. It's never us. It's always God. That's what grace means. So, he's the supreme authority over the church. He's seated in heaven while his spiritual body is in the flesh on planet earth representing him. Now, all this stuff going on with America, we're the body of Christ. It says if Christ is here, we are his body, we are his reps, we are his ambassadors. Asking the world, pleading with the world, be reconciled to God. Not just give me justice as a nation, not just protect my human freedom as a nation, 
all through, listen, we've had the most privilege of any, maybe anybody that's ever lived to live in this nation, in our Constitution. It came, it came about through genius people who studied history immensely, understood things so much, and set up, but listen, all of those fall. This thing can't go on forever. It's not meant to. So maybe we're at the end of it, the beginning of the end. I don't know. Never thought I'd see that, but I'm seeing it. It's just a crazy time. But listen, that's not who we are, and that's not what we're about, and that's not our mission. Our mission is to plead with the unbeliever to be reconciled to God. That's our mission. If I'm wrong, tell me. I can take it. The beginning. He says he's the beginning. He returned in his new body. He seemed to have enhanced abilities. In Luke 24, 31, he's on the road to Emmaus with these believers, and they didn't recognize him. I mean, apparently he, was, he knew them well. They knew who he was. He has this discussion with him, with these guys. And it says, at one point he said a certain phrase that he had said many times to them, and they went, oh, and he disappeared. Poof. He poofed. Then the disciples, I mean, a few verses later, Luke 24, the disciples are all together in a locked room. John says the door was locked. He materialized among them. In fact, it was such, he startled them so much, he just appeared. They thought it was a ghost. That's what John said. John said they thought it was a ghost. And he said, chill out, dudes. Come here and touch me. I'm not a ghost. But he materialized. Okay? How do you do that? It says, they touched his scarred hands and feet. He ate a piece of broil. He said, you got anything to eat? I mean, that's what I would say. Where's the refrigerator? I mean, every, uh, about 100 times a day, I, I visualize myself in front of the refrigerator. I need to keep erasing that because I'm, I'm adding to myself. All right. He ate a piece of broiled fish. Then in John 20, 19 through 21, you add the Thomas story, you know, that he didn't believe. So 1 John 3, 2 says we will have a body like his. Our body will be changed into a resurrection body. This is at the rapture of the church. We'll all be given. Some believe it'll be this body that's transformed into the new body. Others, not so sure. You know, bodies that were blown up or ate by fish or whatever, you know, that just don't exist anymore will be brought back. I don't know. It won't matter. You'll have a brand new body. This body will not get sick. It will not wear out. It will not get tired. It will not ache. You won't have any low back pain. You know, your knees won't go out and have to have surgeries and all these things. Uh, you will have, per your, you won't get Alzheimer's in your spiritual body. You, you'll, you'll be strong and vigorous and incredible forever. That'd be cool. Wouldn't that be nice? Absolutely. It's going to be nice. It's going to be nice to have a new body. And this new body is going to be able to do incredible things. It can be able to fly and materialize. Listen, we're going to be able to have lunch on Jupiter. As if you'd want to have lunch on Jupiter. I don't know what they serve on Jupiter. You know, it's probably pretty spicy there. But we're going to be, we're going to be the new, uh, a new army. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 38, a mortal body changed to an immortal, a, dishonor to, a dishonored body to honor body, weakness to power, a natural to a spiritual body. So Christ could transport himself to wherever he wanted to be. He could appear and disappear at will. He could fly into the heavens and eat whatever he wanted without getting fat, and I say, thank you, Lord. So... My idea of a Christmas story is not just a baby in a manger. It's, I'm really kind of hooked on this new beginning thing. He's the beginning. I'm really kind of hooked on waiting on this body 
that can do things, you know. And uh, I'm sure this body's going to be able to drive the ball about 400 yards straight down the middle. And that'll be good. All right, we're, we're at our end. Uh, are there any announcements to make, Pastor? No? Brand? Okay, let's close. And again, I thank you for coming and listening. I thank you for continuing to support our church. If you're here with us online, uh, we're here to serve you. If there's a way that we can help you, please contact us. Let us know. Send us an email. Uh, send a pigeon. Our life is here to serve yours. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the Lord Jesus Christ. For God the Son in eternity past and for all of the planning and all, all of the work, this, this incredible person who decided to become one of us, that he might come and rescue us from our own failures and our own flaws and Oh, so much, so much, Father, that, that we owe you, the gratitude that we owe you for that. And then he goes through death. He goes through the death that we all are tempted to fear, that we, we hate about our loved ones that are gone and that we feel like we've lost them, but we haven't. And then he comes back and says, a new beginning has started. It's a whole new day. Uh, a human being has come back in a resurrection body and he's going to lead the rest of us into the resurrection life, a life of eternity, of great adventures, and a life where there's not going to be an end to the joy and to the happiness and the challenges and the growth and all that's ahead of us, Father. Don't let us think of death as the end. It's just the beginning. It's the beginning of the beginning. We thank you so much for that and we praise you now in Christ's name. Amen.